Yep. Well, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening to you all. It's good to see so many of you this evening. And uh, it's a special welcome to our speaker this evening, Mark Fitzpatrick from Iron Reformed Baptist Church in Dublin. And uh, his brother Catherine and Ian Ryan, who is a member of the church. Uh, we appreciate him coming up uh, today to speak this evening. But, He's been doing that every month for the past number of months, helping us out, going out door to door with us. So we appreciate the support and fellowship that we enjoy with our Reform Baptist Church. And may it long continue well. So you're all very welcome. And the subject this evening is why does God allow bad things to happen? That's a very apt topic because we're all prone to all sorts of illnesses and diseases and problems and issues and persecutions and all sorts of things. So we're looking forward to what the brother has to say this evening. After he's finished, there is time for a few questions to put to him, hopefully not too difficult. And uh, he gives him a few questions and, and it's generally it's a not say heated discussion, but a bit of a or a discussion that way, which is good. And then afterwards we'll stop for the time of supper. Some some refreshments, and uh, we can continue on uh, with the discussions. It's good to have a lot of others this evening, and uh, you don't want to have me stand up here for too long, so I'll, I'll hand over to Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Colin, and for the uh, welcome. It's always good to be here, and uh, we feel uh, more than welcome and more than loved in uh, joining with you. And um, uh, it is a, uh, an interesting subject, a subject that quite often people will um, bring up as uh, an excuse to question God. Why does God allow bad things uh, to happen? And for the believer, this is not, uh, or at least should not remain a mystery because we have the Word of God. Uh, and therefore, for those who are willing to submit uh, to what God has said, to believe what God has said, uh, we have the answers uh, to all these difficult questions that God has decided to reveal uh, his worthy answer to. Uh, so uh, it is a privilege as God's people to gather uh, around the word of God and uh, together. There are four points I want to look at in our um, considerations uh, this evening. First of all, I'll give you the, the four points and then we'll go through them one by one. Uh, first of all, bad things do happen in the world, and you don't have to be a genius to uh, uh, to, to state that, and uh, that, is, that is true. Bad things do happen uh, in the world. Secondly, the wrong answer to the question, the wrong answer to the question. Thirdly, the right answer to the question, and then lastly, the reason. So, why does God allow bad things to happen? Bad things do happen in the world. Back in 2017, the Telegraph newspaper released an article outlining um, the worst natural disasters to that point of, of the year. And they included Hurricane Maria in the Dominican Republic, the 24th of September 2017, after Hurricane Maria, a major Atlantic hurricane of the 2017 season. The earthquake in Mexico, which was a, a magnitude earthquake of 7.1, rocked Mexico on the 20th, 20th of September, killing more 
than 200 people. Then there was the monsoon flooding in Bangladesh, which caused devastation in parts of India, Bangladesh and Nepal, killing more than 1,200 people. Aid agencies were calling this flood one of the worst regional humanitarian crises in years, with more than 40 million people affected. Then there was the mudslide in Colombia, a deadly mudslide that the paper said killing at least 200 people in, uh, in, in that part of Colombia uh, in early April 2017. And then two weeks later, dozens of hillsides get away. Then there was Hurricane Irma in the USA and the Caribbean, a category five storm, the most powerful Atlantic storm in a decade and caused widespread destruction across the Caribbean and the southern United States. Then there was the flooding and the landslides in Sierra Leone, and this is all just in 2017. On the 14th of August 2017, at least 312 people were killed and more than 2,000 left homeless when heavy flooding and landslides hit Sierra Leone's capital. And then lastly, there was Hurricane Harvey in the US uh, caused extreme flooding in Port Arthur, Texas. Uh, it first hit on the 25th of August 2017 and the most powerful hurricane to hit Texas in more than 50 years. So bad things do happen. Disasters happen in the world and we just need to establish that and that sort of focuses our minds, doesn't it? it if I'd have asked you maybe before quoting those seven uh, disasters, could you remember? You probably would have forgotten most of those, but just to get that even into, into your mind uh, for that period of, of that year focuses our attention uh, on the subject, doesn't it? Well, we have two answers. First of all, the wrong answer. What is the wrong answer? If we're to ask that question, why does God allow bad things to happen in the world or evil things or disasters, what is the wrong answer? Well, responding to the Haiti disaster, Archbishop of York, John Satamu, is that how you pronounce his name? Santamu. Santamu, sorry, Santamu, said that he had nothing to say, quote, he had nothing to say to make sense of this horror. The Archbishop of York, had nothing to say to make sense of this horror. Should a leading churchman, a man who claims to represent God, claims to represent the, uh, the God who gives us the answers, should any Christian even, never mind a, a leader, should any Christian say, well, we, we have nothing to say? We're speechless. That's a, def that's a defeat of our faith, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be a defeat of the Christian faith? If we don't have an answer for these things, anything that, any belief system that matters must have an answer. Must have an answer for these things. Must be able to give a, a legitimate, not that we can give the best answer possible, but we must be able to say something. When people look us in the face and say, why is this happening? We must have an answer. And for an archbishop to say, we have nothing to say. Nothing to say to make sense of this horror. No gospel application. No comfort. No wonder that church and many other so-called Christian churches are in a mess. They're in a mess because they have no response. They have no answer. To give no answer is definitely the wrong answer. Another bishop, and I, I tried to search for this and um, I couldn't find who it was, but you probably will remember a similar disaster happened a number of years ago. And his response was that this had nothing to do with God. It had nothing to do with God. And that's, I don't know whether you'd say that's as bad or worse than the, than, than the first one I gave, 
Uh, but again, here is a bishop saying that this has nothing to do with God. In other words, uh, either God, according to the first bishop, uh, has no response, or he's completely irrelevant. That's what the message of these men is. The message that they give is that our, our God is completely irrelevant. When, when, when things get bad, we don't have a God that has a part to play or has a purpose or even has an explanation of what's going on. So when the pop group, the Beagles, went to over to India or wherever it was, they went for answers and found that there was nothing better over there either than what they had. We must give answers. But not answers off the top of our heads, not just what we think, but what the scripture reveals to us. What does the scripture say about such men as these two bishops? I'm in my own personal devotions, I'm reading and rereading Zephaniah and uh, a book about the day of judgment, the day of the Lord. And in Zephaniah 1, verse 12, it says this It shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees. Listen to this now, this is the, the key part of the verse that say in their heart, not even outwardly, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. What are they saying? Who are these ones that God will bring judgment upon? The ones who say that God is completely detached from the reality of life and the reality of this world. And the Lord says he will bring judgment, punishment upon those who think, not outwardly say it, but think in their mind and heart that the Lord will do nothing good or evil. That's not the God we believe in. We believe in a God that is not only actively involved, but rules the universe by the word of his power. Then there's the, what's called trilemma of the Greek philosopher, and I'll probably get the name wrong again, Epicurus, am I right? Epicurus? Yes. And his trilemma is summarized by the 18th century Scotsman David Hume this way. One, if God is unable to prevent evil, then he's not all-powerful. Two, if God is not willing to prevent evil, then he is not all-good. Three, if God is both willing and able to prevent evil, then why does evil exist? And many people say these things, and as we said at the beginning, they're stated and the heart of man is desperately wicked. They're stated as reasons not to believe in God. But these must be answered from Scripture. And we must give, can I say this, we must give a better answer than, for example, our Arminian brethren, who quite often run for refuge in these things to the free will of man. So it's not God's fault, it's all because of what man has done. No, no, we believe in a God who, uh, before the foundation of the world, decreed all that comes to pass. So we don't run for refuge as if God needs to be protected from these questions and just blame man for everything. So we must answer not from our own thoughts. Or I love what Calvin, how the, the way Calvin puts this, not from our own brains. You know, inventing answers from our own brains. Psalm 94, verse 11. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. So, a few weeks ago, we had the death of Stephen Hawking. A man who was regarded as one of the greatest minds of the last 50 years. 
And yet the thoughts of his mind regarding these things were vanity. And the Lord knows that the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. So the thoughts of our minds are vanity, but we are blessed because God is dealing with us from his word, from his truth. So thirdly, the right answer. What is the right answer? Well, let me first of all correct the title, which I get. I think it was me that gave the title, and I'm going to correct it. The title, Why Does God Allow, is in itself faulty. God does not allow, as we would think, as if, you know, a child walks in to the room and we just let the child, we allow the child to do what it wants. That's not the right answer. Our confession of faith puts it this way, on God's decree. Chapter 3 of the Confession of Faith. God hath decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably all things whatsoever comes to pass. So we don't believe in a God who passively allows things. We believe in a God who has decreed all things, who is sovereign over all things. So I, I watched the debate between a, an atheist and an Armenian regarding the fall of man. And the Armenian really couldn't answer the, the probing questions of the atheist because he could not run for refuge to this doctrine of God's sovereign decree. We don't have to make an excuse for God. We don't have to, to run for refuge to anything else but to the doctrine of God's sovereign decree. So we say with Paul in Romans 9, Who art thou, O man, that repliest against God? Shall the thing that is formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me thus? God is sovereign. God is king of the universe. We don't have to explain for God. We just say, God has decreed all things. God has sovereignly chosen all things that has happened. And that's why Isaiah 46, turn there with me for a moment, Isaiah 46 and Verse 9 really emphasizes this. Isaiah 46, verse 9 states, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. And then really what's, what the Lord is saying here, he's, he's showing how unique he is. There's none else. I am God. There's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure, calling a ravenous bird from the east, and the man that executed my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass, I have purposed it, I will also do it. Now here's the point. One of the chief problems, if not the chief problems of the modern evangelical God is that it, it has removed this God from Scripture. Can we turn down the volume just slightly? Is that possible? I'm just finding it slightly distracting. Sorry. Don't need aid with the volume, really. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. 
As Luther said to Erasmus, and I can quote Luther with a fresh fingernail being in Germany only uh, this week, when he said to Erasmus, your God is just too human. Your God is just too little. You know, you, you don't have the, the big God of Scripture. You don't have the, the almighty God. You don't have the sovereign God. Erasmus, you, you've got the wrong God. And that is the problem, isn't it? We, most of the professing church does not have the God of Isaiah 46. God is saying in Isaiah 46, I will do all my pleasure, I will do all, <coughs> excuse me, all my counsel shall stand. That's the God we believe in. The God who's never taken by surprise. So, as we listed all the different tragedies and, and disasters, we, we read them and we say, oh, that is terrible. And yes, from our perspective, but from God's perspective, all has been decreed, all has been ordained. Nothing surprises Him. And that's what we take refuge in. We don't have to explain for God. God explains himself. God says, I am God. Be silent before me, all the earth. Don't, don't imagine in your heart to speak against me. Don't, don't imagine that you can, for a moment, stand before me and question me. And it's not even that God can say that because God is, um, as someone once said, might is right. It's not that. I think of the day of judgment that it won't be God's immensity that will condemn the, the lost and the guilty and the unbelieving. It will be God's purity. It will be God's holiness. It will be God's inestimable justice that will condemn the unbelievers. It won't be might is right. It won't be the one who has the biggest stick. No, it will be the one who is pure in all his ways. A man who is wicked will stand before the purity of God and be condemned by God's holiness. Then one New Testament text is Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11 which reads in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh, listen to this who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will now it's a very practical application here you, you know the way we, we sometimes have in our minds the way things should go. And we, we sort of have a, a, an idea of the, the, the best way, you know, and, uh, and then when, when it just doesn't go that way, we, we feel a bit grieved and even a, a bit grieved with the Lord. Well, as believers, we need to learn that the best for us is not what we think. I think I'd be far happier if I didn't have all the sins that, you know, that, 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 that really are still part of who I am. If I could just be sinless, I'd be happy. If I just never committed another sin. But you know what the Lord has, has taught me? If that was the case, I'd be the proudest Christian in the world. I'd be the most arrogant Christian. And suddenly I would have committed the worst sin. <laughs> so God knows best. His counsel shall stand. And, and that should, more than anything else, comfort our hearts. That the God who has saved us, the God who has delivered us, he has set out before us his purpose, 
His way, His plan, His salvation. Rest in that. Rest in that. See, this is the this is the pastoral, this is the practical benefit of this question. So for the believer, I know this meeting, the purpose of this meeting is to reach out uh, to those who are inquiring. But as believers here tonight, as those who believe in God, this question is so pastorally, practically important to take hold of and to believe in. So the right answer is the answer of God's decree. God not only allows things to happen, God ordains everything that happens. And there's a, there's a wonderful follow-on from that that I'll give you in a, in a couple of moments. But let me close with the last point, and there's three uh, subsections of this last point that we'll close with. The reason. What's the reason? And there's a threefold reason. First reason is the glory of God. Turn with me to Isaiah 45 and verse 5. Isaiah 45 and verse 5. In a similar thought that we had in the previous quote from Isaiah. Isaiah 45 and uh, verse 5. The glory of God being the reason. Listen to what the Lord says. I am the Lord. There's none else. There's no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there's none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light. I create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Get that for a moment. It, for the believer, it, it's, it's not a point of the, when we consider that God does the good and even all those evil things, those disasters, it's not a point of losing faith. It increases our faith. It, it substantiates our faith that our God is, is not just on one side of the battle. You know, there was a, a, a song, and I, I, like last time, I'm not going to mention the song, I don't want to put a song into your head, but there was a song in, in the late 70s, early 80s, and, and, and it was actually from a, a writer in the South, and the picture, the, the picture that was presented in, in the song was a, a battle between the devil and God. And God was on one side and the devil on the other. And I won't go any further because I don't, I don't want to put other thoughts into your mind. But this is not what this verse is teaching. This verse is teaching that God is, is the one who is in, in, in control of all things. Sovereign over all things. So therefore in verse 8. Drop down ye heavens from above. And let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation. And let righteousness spring up together. I the Lord have created it. And the application in verse 9. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou? Or thy work he hath no hands. The glory of God is the reason. And we are to stand in awe of him. We are to stand in amazement that the God who is in control of all things. And therefore, not to be shaken in our faith, but established in our faith, worshipping our God. That's the first reason. And then the second reason is the good of his people. 
the good of his people. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. The glory of God and then the good of his people. Romans 8, 28. Well known verse. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the call according to his purpose. But let's just reflect on that for a moment. Every single thing that happens is designed for the good of the believer. Every single thing that happens. Ephesians says he is the head over all things to or for the sake of the church. He is sovereign for your sake. Isn't that amazing? God is sovereign for the blessing of his people, for the good of his people. God has given his sovereignty for the welfare of his people. Listen, even parents have a line they draw. They love their children, but they've not done what God has done for us. They've not done what God has done for us. God has committed the very central characteristic of his being to the good of your soul, to the welfare of your soul. So when we ask the question, why does God allow bad things to happen? And why does God decree what happens? It is for not only his glory, but for the good of your soul. As a child of God. Look what it goes on to say, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called and then we call them, he also justified. And then we justify, he also glorified. And Paul is basically outlining the whole uh, spectrum of salvation, as some have called it the golden chain of salvation. Paul has presented before us the whole wide ranging spectrum of all that God has done for your eternal welfare. And then he responds in verse 31 What shall we say then? What's our response to this? If God be for us, who can be against us? See, the blessed benefit of this truth. When we explore, when we study this truth, we end up not with a weakened faith, not with a diminished faith, but a strengthened faith, an established faith, a growing faith. So if we believe in a God that only really does some of the good things, well really, that's not going to make us strong Christians. If you believe in a God that ordains all that comes to pass from the beginning to the end, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, He's the sovereign over all things. The one that even the demons must ask. Listen to this. Get this into your heart. The demons had to ask Jesus if they could even go into a herd of swine. They had to ask his permission to enter some pigs. What does that teach us? What is Mark 5 teaching us? That he is sovereign over all things. Listen, the Lord Jesus said, not even a swallow falls to the earth without the will of your Father. Even the hairs of your head, and for some of us that's a bit easier, even the hairs of your head are numbered. And I used to think that was wonderful. I used to think that's a really nice thought. So God knows that I have maybe, I'll guess, 450 hairs of a human male, maybe. But here's what's better. The actual meaning is that God knows which one is number 45. God knows which one is number 57. 
That's what it means. He is named, as Psalm 147 tells us, he names all the stars, every one of them has a name. The billions upon billions of stars, he's got a name for each one. And all of this is done for the blessing of his people, for the comfort of his people, for the joy of his people. But then lastly, there is a gospel implication. And this is really, this is, when I suggested um, this subject, this was actually was the first thought I had. We're going to close with Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. This is the gospel. So the glory of God, the good of his people, and the gospel implication. Luke chapter 13 and verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood piled that mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus knew their thoughts. The Lord knew their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking. John 2 tells us he knew what they were thinking. He didn't need for anyone to tell them, for he knew what was in a man. He knows your heart and mind. He knows exactly, I don't know, you, you could be thinking that's the worst sermon I've ever heard, it's the worst message, the worst preacher. I don't know, you could be smiling at me and thinking that. God knows. God knows your heart. God knows your mind. And, and therefore, it makes no sense to play games with God. You know, you can play games with the preacher. You can say, lovely sermon preacher, and secretly think, what a lot of rubbish. But, you know, don't play games with God. Don't play games with God. He knows your heart. He knows your mind. He, in fact, the scripture says that God even knows not only what you think, but the very motives why you think that. And sometimes you don't even know that. He knows what you're thinking, why you're thinking it, how you're thinking it. And the book of Revelation says the day is coming when we'll stand before God and God will open the books. What does that mean? It doesn't mean literal books. It means that God will open you. God will open your heart. God will open your mind. God will open your soul. And God will reveal all that is therein contained. And you will be read like a book. Calvin said that it's a, it's a mercy that our souls are contained within a body. You know, that our true natures are contained in the body. So we can't see. If you knew all my sins, you'd say, what are you standing up there preaching for? Who gives you the right to preach to me? Because you're just as bad as I am. Yes, I am. I'm probably worse. But it's not about me. It's with the God that we all have to deal with. Oh, yeah. The God that we all will stand before and we won't be able to laugh him off or we won't be able to ignore him. Because there's a, another thing we have, we have the, the blushing blink, don't we? Or look away. We get embarrassed. We stand before God. There'll be no eyelids to close the eyes. There'll be nowhere to turn. Get ready to meet your God. Prepare to meet your God. Prepare to meet him. The Lord knew their thoughts. And knowing their thoughts, he says, suppose you, do you suppose that the Galileans were sinners of all the Galileans because they suffered these things? We think that, don't we? Oh, such and such down the road, you know, got really ill. God must be unhappy with him. But God's happy with me because look at me, I've never been sick. All is well. Oh, but, but he, God must be really unhappy with him. The Lord Jesus answers that thought, that self righteous thought, that arrogant thought. He says, 
in verse 3, I tell you, nay. But, listen to what he says, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. The events, and the, the next one says the same thing, verses 4 and 5 is a repetition. Two events, both with the same message. And the message is this, whether it's your blood mixed with sacrifices or a tower falling on you, the message is this, repent, repent. Don't think that you are better. In fact, there's three things at least the Lord Jesus is saying here. First of all, we are no better than anybody who suffers the worst fate in this world. So, somebody commits a crime, and we think, I'd never do that. And the Bible says that everyone professes their own goodness. Every man, every man says how good, even to yourself, you say it. But a righteous man who can find. Jesus is saying, there's no difference. It happened to them, but it could have just as easily happened to you. So what he's saying is, this is a message from God. Not particularly to the people it happened to, but generally to the world. So we read of seven disasters in 2017. God's message to the world through those disasters is repent. You know the, the funny story that some people have, I think one of the speakers told it here, you know, where, I don't know if I really agree with it, but it, it makes a point. The man who, who prayed, he's in it, there's a flood, the flood waters are coming through, and he prays that, that God would deliver him, and he gets assurance that, that God will deliver him, and the boat comes along and says, no, no, God is going to deliver me. Helicopter comes along. And the story goes that he dies and he questions God. And it's, it's, it's given as a joke, as, as a funny story. But you know, there's a serious side to that story. When God responds, I did send help. And there's people that live their whole life in this world and say, if God just reveals himself this, this much more, maybe just this much more, then I'll believe. How much more does God have to reveal himself? How much more does God have to prove to you that you need to repent? That you need to believe in the gospel? And for those of us who are believers, how much more does God have to do to convince you to no longer live for yourself? To no longer live your selfish life, my selfish life, and live for him. The other lesson that the Lord is teaching here is we deserve these things to happen to us. Every time, every time a disaster happens, we deserve that. We deserve worse than that, don't we? We deserve much worse. We deserve the very hell itself. But then the last lesson is worse than these things will happen to us if we do not submit to God and his word. See, people go to extremes, don't they? On this issue. Some people say, well, I know what God said, but I'm just going to live my own life. The other group say, well, what God says is not enough for me, I want to do much more. So some people live their life in a nightclub, and some people live their life in a monastery, and both are wrong. Both are equally wrong. Why do I say that? Because neither is doing what God says. Because the gospel is trust 
in him. Trust in him as he has revealed himself in his word. And stop, it goes back to the earlier thought. Stop resting in your own logic. Stop finding refuge in your own thoughts. And seek the Lord in his word. Seek the Lord in his word. I remember going to a book reading. My wife said to me one time, let's do something different, you know, just something that normal people don't do, really, or most normal people don't do, we'll go to a book reading. And this author had done a book, and I can't remember what the book was, what it was about, but I remember just having the one feeling as I sat there, and it came to question time. And maybe I feel the pressure now, and all the question time is coming to end this as well, but it came to question time. And I remember I had nothing to say. Why did I have nothing to say? Because I hadn't read the book. I hadn't read the book. And, and there was people over here asked, yeah, on page 126 you said this, and what did you mean? And I thought, all these people sound very knowledgeable. I hadn't a clue because I hadn't read the book. You know, one day we're going to meet God. And there's people going to stand before God and they've never read his word. And one of the questions God's going to ask, did you think that I was so below you that you didn't even have time to read my word? And now you're panicking. 